Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome here to our new wonderful talk today of meeting people where they are with Eli. And I'm Paula Bay, your co-host for this session at Earth Action Hub. I just want to say also thank you, um, not only to Tanya's time for um, giving us Eli to do this amazing talk, but also to uh, Susie Bascon of, of uh, Peace Brigade UK for also making it possible. And I pass it to you, Jessica, thank you. Thanks, Paola. I just want to give Eli a quick introduction before I give him the virtual floor. So um, Eli is a senior social justice consultant at 10 Years Time, where he works with the wider team researching social justice issues in relation to addressing systemic challenges in society. In recent years, he has begun working more and more on climate change issues, specifically relating to engaging with marginalized communities to build community-centered approaches to mitigating climate change. So I think we are really in for a treat here. So um, without further ado, Eli, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Paula. I'm really happy to be here, joining all the way from sunny Manchester in the UK. Um, that is a joke, it's not very sunny and it's always raining here. But um, yeah, really happy to be a part of this really special day and event. Um, and yeah, um, I was gonna say lovely to see you all, but I can't see you from here, but wherever you are, hello. Um, and yeah, and well done everybody just coming together and, and really recognizing our collective power for change in relation to climate change. I think it's a really special um, event and um, yeah looking forward to sharing a little bit with you so without further ado I'm going to share um, a bit of a presentation that I prepared today um, um, that will be a bit of an overview of my work um, in relation to the, um, the title of this session and then yeah would love to open it up to some questions um, so yeah let's go Cool. So as Jessica mentioned, my name is Eli. I'm the Senior Social Justice Consultant at 10 Years Time. So 10 Years Time um, is an organisation based in the UK. It's a philanthropy advisory organisation, but also a social change organisation. And I guess our kind of elevator pitch about what we do is that we work with um, power holders um, and communities and essentially try to bridge the gap between where those two parties sit, understanding that for change to be authentic and sustainable, um, power holders need to move closer to the communities they exist to serve, and community members need to be centred in those organisations, um, particularly in relation to funding and deciding where funds go to support social change. Um, so 10 years time, we work in kind of three main areas. So domestic social change in the UK, um, international work and then climate change and more recently we've developed um, a sister agency called Impatience Earth whose sole purpose is to move huge amounts of capital and money into the climate action space understanding that particularly in the UK well not particularly in the UK all over the world we're really starved of, of the resources to continue and grow the amazing work that we're doing and I sit across these two organizations and then just a little plug, I'm also the co-founder of the Embassy of Blackness, which is a Black-led um, um, black platform that seeks to sustain and empower um, Black change makers around the world to sustain our own change and our own image, understanding that it's often quite hard to, to um, resource our change when we have to rely on funders that might not explicitly understand the circumstances that we sit in and what we need to do. So yeah, anyway, meeting people where they are at um, and building community power for climate action. So, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the blockers that present, that um, are preventing or slowing charities and charitable organizations from acting um, in, to mitigate climate change. I'm gonna also look at the opportunity that exists um, and then talk a little bit about the reality from the funding perspective. I think it's really important to understand the strategic level um, about where resources are flowing. Um, and then I'm going to bridge to my journey in relation to climate change and working on um, climate mitigation and look and kind of zoom in to the environmental inequalities in London 
um, where I'm built, building a project at the moment. And then I'm going to talk to that project that meets people where they're at and, and builds community power for climate action. So the barriers. Um, I work really closely with a lot of funders in the UK and internationally. And I'm just going to be very honest with this. Um, often funders, they love to convene. They love to have lots of conferences and talk to one another about the change that needs to be resourced and funded. But we believe at 10 years time that enough is enough. We just need to act now. And the, the action can sometimes be messy. It can be uncomfortable, but we've just got to get the money out of the door because we don't have the time to waste. Um, um, and then the second one, funding, there's just not enough money going to the climate space. And, and I'll show some figures in a minute, but um, it's really hard when there's such little resources that there's lots of kind of competition from organizations on the ground doing amazing work to get that money. Um, and, that, and that's a real issue because then when the competition rises, it becomes even harder to, to write those funding applications. And for a lot of these organizations, that are doing amazing work on the ground, they don't have the space and time to be able to do that because they're focused working with communities um, to empower, to, to do the work. Um, so that's a real issue that, that I'll probably touch upon later. And then the third point, a limited approach to climate change. At 10 years time, we're very much aware that climate change um, any work to address the environmental degradation we're seeing and the climate change issues needs to be intersectional at heart. Um, climate change hasn't come out of, we've not just pulled out of thin air, um, it's connected to the systems that govern how the globe works. So our economy, um, our socio-political systems and, and much more. So it's really important that we connect all those dots and understand climate change within the system, within the ecosystem that it operates and that it's situated in. Um, and then I include a little bit about unrepresentative boards. So a lot of charities and funding organizations, um, the, the, the staff bodies that, 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 that ensure that these organizations run are often not so reflective of the communities. They're at the sharpest edge of climate change. Um, and that's even further kind of um, really shocking when you look at who sits on those boards and the boards really control the strategic vision of a charity and lay out what they're going to do in the next five to 10 years, let's say, and also govern how money is spent. So in order to kind of create the change we need and to resource the organizations that we know are doing the great work, we need to ensure that members from communities that are traditionally overlooked at board level are, are sat on boards to, to really change the way that money is directed. And then we often see a lot with some of the funders, and this isn't everyone, um, but with a lot of funders that we work with, that they're waiting for instructions to come from above. And as we've seen, the global leadership around climate change is really slow to act um, and um, is, is inauthentic at best in, in their actions. So actually we cannot wait for instructions to come from above. And I think that's one of the great things about this, this, this series of events at the moment is that this is a real call to action for us to act now and, and, and not wait for other people to come and rescue us, but to see what we can do with our networks and through powerful connections across the world. Um, so yeah. Um, and then the last point is that a lot of these charities or funding organizations that traditionally resource this kind of work are often used to speaking to very certain demographics in, in society. Um, and that means that we're, we're, we're ignoring a huge swathe of people that we need to bring along with us um, to ensure that we act um, for everybody. Climate change is an issue, as we all know, that is gonna affect us all um, and some of us more so. Um, and it's really important that those communities that are to to feel to that are to feel the the kind of worst effects of climate change are involved in the conversations, and that therefore that means that we need to widen our view and understanding of how we communicate climate issues. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail shortly. So the opportunity it's not all doom and gloom. Um, I think some of these figures may look good, may look bad, but there's so much space for us to do better. So at the moment in the UK, one to 2% of funding goes to climate change. 
which just isn't enough. So we need to change that. And that's one of the reasons why we created Impatience Earth to significantly transform the amount of capital that's in circulation to, to resource climate change um, action. There's nearly a million paid workers in the charity sector that could be best placed to really lead in terms of applying pressure in all areas of society around climate change. These are also staff members that within their organizations could lead on internal climate action. So applying um, a climate lens to all of their funding commitments or, or services. Um, I recently spoke to a London-based funder that's attaching an, an additional amount of funding to each grant that they give to support charities that includes, and this amount is for um, the climate proofing of their facilities and things like this. So there's lots of things we can do. And then I show the number of charities, so nearly 170,000 in the UK. Imagine if all these organisations were signed up to um, climate commitments in their kind of um, their particular area of focus. Um, it could be really powerful. And then we see the amount of income, 48 billion yearly. Um, and it's really important that we reflect on that. And I'm not going to go into this, but if anyone has questions or want to know more, do let me know at the end. But essentially, we do a lot of work at 10 years time around divesting the funds that, that charities and funders use, understanding that the, the vast majority of funds in circulation in the charity sector are invested in the most polluting industries in the world that allow them to keep growing their wealth so they can fund social change. But there's a fundamental hypocrisy there that you're supporting the fossil fuel industry and then giving the 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 kind of five percent of profits off the top of those investments to support climate action work and that just can't continue um so yeah i say all of this um i guess to say that there's so much opportunity for us to do things um, but it's important that we see the whole picture so yeah so the reality i mentioned some of this before but a lot of um the climate work that's going on in the UK particularly is already preaching to the converted. We need to widen our lens and include people. We need to listen to people that aren't involved in those conversations and understand why they're not there. How do we reach them? How do we meet them where they're at? Um, and, and those, the power holders that resource climate action are often extremely disconnected from these communities that will be most affected by climate change. So um, there's so many figures out there and I'll touch upon them in a bit, but particularly in London, for example, where I do a lot of my work, um, poorer communities are often situated closer to areas where there's higher pollution levels um, and, and, and lots of things like that. Um, and I've already spoken about the communication of climate issues being disconnected from the concerns of communities. Um, but I think that it's really important to look at this in a way that for many people that are potentially struggling right now, um, climate change might not be ranked um, as the highest concern in their mind. You know, a lot of people are just trying to survive, work, look after their children and so many things. And we've got to the ones that have the space and the time and the energy to do so and the privilege to some extent we've got to try and work really hard to bring climate change to people in a way that fits with their day-to-day -day routines and what they're doing and what they need um and there's something here about climate mainstream climate narratives are often not culturally sensitive um and we for me, it's really important in my work that we listen to different communities and cultures and see what they are doing already that is climate friendly or is positions them closer to nature in, in listening to the needs of the planet. And then we can also learn so much from these communities rather than it being a bit of a one way traffic system where we're kind of preaching to people that this is the way to protect the planet. Um, and then finally, that climate change often is pitched as an issue that we're equally responsible for, but that is just not the case. The global north is in our position today because we've extracted so much from the global south throughout history. And actually, is it fair for us to, to tell people in the global south or communities now living in the global north from those areas that they're equally responsible for the issues that we see today? Um, so I think that's just an important point to, to hold in our mind as we, as we do climate action work. So my journey. So um, like I said at the beginning, I'm from Manchester, um, live in the UK. I've, I've lived around the world um, over the course of my life. Um, and 
I'll be completely honest, I wasn't someone until maybe the last two years, I wasn't someone that was particularly active in climate change conversations. I knew the importance of climate change and I knew that it was going to affect us all. But in my mind, there were so many other issues that I was trying to fight for um, that felt way more pressing to me. And as I've grown and I've learned and I've read and I've listened, I've understood that climate change is equally as important. Um, and I've been shocked as I enter the kind of the halls of power and I, and I come to, to consult my clients and speak to them about the issues that present in relation to climate change, that there's often no one there that looks like me. Um, and, and that's really concerning when I've started to learn about how communities of colour, particularly, are going to be one of the communities that are most affected by climate change in the UK. Um, so we had the case um, a few years ago of a, of a young a young girl in London who sadly um, died as a result of air pollution levels in London in the North Circular. Her name was Ella Kissy Deborah, and her mum's done an amazing job of building a really powerful campaign to to petition for for greater attention to illegal air pollution levels in London. But unfortunately. LA is probably not the only kid that is passed away, sadly, due to air pollution levels. But unfortunately, those, those figures are really high when it comes to areas where predominantly people of colour live in the major cities in the UK, often being the communities that have the, the, the lowest access to capital and therefore live in some of the, the poorest quality housing um, that's positioned closest to main roads and things like that. And I guess for me, as I learn of these, these issues and the way that um, kind of poverty in our community correlated with um, exposure to the, the negative effects of climate change, I felt like I really had to do something. And particularly when I, when I looked out there and I saw some organisations that, um, that were doing some seemingly really powerful stuff. So Extinction Rebellion, I'm not here to pass judgment. I see they do amazing stuff. You know, things are complex. Um, they can be good and bad. Um, but, you know, as an organization, as a, as a movement rather, Extinction Rebellion didn't appeal to me due to its proximity to the police, for example, that my community has a whole history of distrust for very valid reasons why we don't engage with the police so much. And I think last summer, the events and the murder of George Floyd have really highlighted that to, to the mainstream. So for me, there weren't really any climate movements or organizations out there that I saw that, that appealed to me and appealed to my peers. So I really thought to myself, what can what can I do, given my access, um, working closely with funders and closely with communities um, that are building grassroots um, initiatives and community organizing. And I also thought about um, my family in Jamaica, my, my family's from Jamaica, and um, I visit there often. And as I learn of the, the real pressing issues that are going on right there right now, um, we just don't have the time and also understanding our unique position here in the UK, closer to power, closer to, to, to money, essentially, what could we do to, to support? So um, last, oh, not last year, in 2019, um, I was asked to join a programme in London called Civic Futures that was built by um, the Mayor of London's office and a number of partners who were really keen to kind of light touch support um, leaders um, of social change in London to, to connect with one another and see what natural partnerships would present if they were given the time and the resources to think and connect. Um, and it was a really beautiful program that, that allowed me as someone that's not from London to really connect and listen and chat with people that have been creating change for a really long time in London, particularly um, a lot of the elders um, across London. And I think it's so important that, that we, we connect with elders because they've been doing this so long and they have such rich insight to share. Um, but it was a really great space to, to learn more about what was going on and who had particular um, interests that may be aligned with others. And through that, basically, um, I connected with my colleague on the project that I'm going to speak about shortly called Niall, who was running um, a Black-led um, organisation called After Party, which seek to, um, I guess, diversify the voices um, 
that are present in the world of architecture and also understand the importance and power of the built environment for mental health reasons, but also looking at how climate change connects with that. You know, I mentioned before that a lot of the housing stock in where communities of colour in the big cities in the UK are predominantly located is really poor um, and is also, you know, um, really badly insulated, so is therefore polluting a lot more. And we came together and we started speaking about what could we do together, understanding that, that our passions aligned, but we had different skills and different networks. And we came together and we proposed a project um, to work with um, the GLA, the Greater London Authority, to, to really listen to communities and build something that, that they could that they could really co-create with us in an authentic manner. And um, build climate expertise in these communities to move forward and, and to grow into whatever that looked like. So yeah, I'm going to touch on the environmental inequalities in London now. So in London, ethnic minorities disproportionately live in areas with higher levels of air, noise and light pollution, lower levels of green spaces, higher exposure to urban heat islands, uh, heat island effects. There are also links between some wider environmental health issues and likelihood to contract COVID-19. People living in parts of London with high income deprivation and high proportions of black, mixed or other ethnic groups are disproportionately affected by air pollution, another survey. Um, and then it talks about children um, from lower income groups and communities of colour being less likely to frequently visit the natural environment. And we've also recognised these inequalities in active travel. Um, so in Tower Hamlets, there are twice as number of white regular cyclists compared to cyclists from, um, from communities of colour. So that's the kind of the, the backdrop to, to, what, to what we saw and why we saw a real need to build something that, that addressed some of this. We understand that we can't address all of it, but we needed to do something with our power and our access. So... I was really keen with this and um, I mentioned before about the disconnects in a lot of projects that I see um, and I, from the get-go it was really important for me that this project would be different. So a lot of the activities um, that I see in the charity sector in relation to climate change, excuse me, um, often reach audiences who are already relatively culturally and environmentally engaged. So we wanted to change that. We wanted to go outside of that scope in order to make more meaningful and deeper impacts with communities. We wanted to design programs for specific communities who are less engaged, improving their connection with and perception of the natural environment. So it was really important that we didn't just do a catch all type of project, that we were really specific with who we were trying to target. And often that's been an issue in getting funding because funders don't like that sometimes. They, they don't want to be seen as they're being, you know, supporting a kind of segregated approach. But for me, it's not like that. Different communities have different needs and we need to address them in different ways. So sometimes it's really important that we build targeted programs. Um, so yeah, and we really wanted to make sure that it was effective. Um, so we, we thought long and hard about how we could demonstrate small and tang tangible actions to solve everyday issues with a climate focus. Um, and it was also important that we could demonstrate certain level of successes um, with the project, um, because for a lot of the communities that we were trying to target, there was deep distrust between institutions like the Greater London Authority and those communities, because historically they've been kind of ignored and neglected by the powers that be. Um, so yeah, we wanted this program also to be positive, um, solutions-based, and to look at the environment in the broadest sense, understanding that for many, um, the language that we often associate with climate change is not is not is not something a part of their their language that they use every day um and maybe the, the way that we frame it doesn't actually connect with their concerns but if we kind of broaden it and we look at everything that is affecting someone's life there's ways that we can connect those dots to a climate focused solution or a greener solution so the project um so we built a project called Greener Together Alma Street. It's an area close to the Olympic Park Village in London, an area called Stratford, which is in Newham um, Borough. 
and it's a really diverse borough, um, home to a huge swathe of different communities, diverse communities, um, and kind of it came to prominence in, I guess, on the international scene when we had the Olympics in London. But unfortunately, a lot of the funding that went to the Olympics didn't trickle down into a lot of these areas. And this particular estate um, is kind of wedged between some really fancy high rise housing um, and, and a big shopping centre. And it's really, really, it really stands out, I guess, as an area that really needs some love and attention and has been neglected by traditional funders and institutions that are, that are there to serve these communities. Um, and also for us, it was really important that we worked in an area that was predominantly populated by communities of colour and, and working class communities, um, because not only did we want to build something that these communities could really lead and was, communi as, and was culturally sensitive and all these things, we also wanted this project to um, build a stronger community and grow community cohesion, understanding that a strong together communities are often best place to address climate issues. Um, so yeah, um, and with this project, we, we also aim to address hyper-local issues um, with innovative nature-based and environmental solutions. And we'd hope that then from this work, um, we could upskill and empower residents to take on this change into other boroughs um, and to lead, lead the change um, across London um, and inspire further behaviour change um, and potentially um, grow the um, potential of projects like this and, and the funding that they get to have a bigger impact. So how we met people where they are. So the project adapts to the specific needs of each participating community on a hyper-local scale. So what we've done is just go up, go to people's doors, knock on and just chat before we ask for anything. We just talk. We want to engage as, as outsiders from the community. As I said, I'm from Manchester. I'm not from here. It's really important that we grow trust and that, that, that we chat. Um, um, oh, I've just seen that I've got one minute left. Apologies, Jessica. Um, I talk a lot. So maybe we can talk about this in, in the questions a little bit more. But I guess, yeah, just quickly to say that we wanted it to be genuinely co-governed and it was important that we used a lot of the project budget to employ people directly from the community, understanding that they may not have the skills to, to jump straight into a role like this, but it's really important that we share our knowledge and, and, and support people to, to grow the skills needed. Um, yeah, and let me just quickly move on. So the values, really quickly, nothing about us without us. The community had to be centered in everything that we did. Um, we had to be sensitive to the needs of the community, transparent in what we were doing and in terms of, I guess, um, reflecting on our own power and how it could show up in negative ways in the project, being completely collaborative. And that means paying people for their time, not just me as a consultant working as part of the project team, but everyone who was, who was input in. Um, we believed we can be ambitious. Sometimes the projects that a lot of um, communities that are historically are, are ignored, um, the, the scale of ambition is often quite low. And we believe that we can be super ambitious and bring people with us and make it exciting and be flexible to the needs. So um, I spoke about a lot of the desired outcomes. Um, I can talk about that later, um, but I might leave it at at this point, if that's okay, we can open up into questions and I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about where we are at the project. And I'm happy to be to be really honest and transparent in terms of a lot of the barriers that I've presented, because this is messy, complex work often that, um, the, yeah, it takes a lot of time. So I've also seen the time, Jessica, I've spoken for a lot longer, so apologies. Maybe we don't have time, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share my details and people can ask me questions directly as well. Wow, Eli, I'm so sorry that I have to rush you because that was such an incredible talk and I could listen to you forever and you're talking about such important um, issues as well. Um, the only reason I was rushing is sorry is because there is someone coming on next, but I just wanna, just wanna say that um, thank you so much for highlighting and reminding us that climate issues um, are social justice issues. You know, they're, 
almost the same thing and they lead into each other and they're all connected yeah. Um, and it's so important to remember that and we're not all going to be affected equally by these issues and you're um, always oh, a question here let me quickly ask you this if, if you can answer it very quickly um, Susie asks how you can best persuade funders to support your project what would be your top three tips mm -hmm. to persuade someone to support your project really great question Susie and I'll be quick which is hard for me because I love context but I guess funders just need to come and visit people more to, to reduce that distance from where they sit, to come and speak to people in the communities that are the most affected and to, to grow those relationships, to just really understand where people are at in life and how you can meet them where they're at. Um, I think it's really unfair to, to um, expect people to, to move from where they're at to, to get funding actually. Um, and I think we just need to listen more and talk more and connect more. And I think that will solve so many of our issues. Um, but yeah, happy to expand on anything um, on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Please connect with me. Yeah, there's a lot of love for you um, in the chats and all of your details are in there. So please, if you are interested, reach out to Eli. Um, his website's there and his LinkedIn. I'm sure there are many ways uh, to get involved and it is a crucially important uh topic to be getting involved with so I just want to thank Eli so much for giving us his time I know how busy you are and sharing all this wisdom with us because it's just such an important issue the social justice issues are the same and yeah in the chat everyone is saying thank you so much and how wonderful um, your talk has been so um, yes Eli thank you so much um, guys if you stay on this platform you will see a talk coming up about protesting for the environment um, so slightly linked to this as well. So if you want to stay that, uh, stay here. So thank you, Eli. Nice one, guys. Take care.